It's a day etched in South African history when black students mobilize themselves to protest against Afrikaans as a compulsory medium of instruction in schools. On June 16, 1976, thousands of Sowetan students marched peacefully in protest. It was a watershed moment that unleashed the liberation struggle. The march was meant to culminate at a rally in Orlando Stadium. But on that day, the police were caught off guard. They reacted with violence, releasing tear gas and live ammunition into the crowd. 23 people died on the first day of protests, most of them students, up to a thousand were injured. It's appropriate that we, we sit here and look back and uh, pay homage uh, to those that lost their lives. Fast forward to 2015, some young people have taken the baton from the class of 1976 and continue to make sacrifices in order to make South Africa a better place. I want to make sure that no child goes to school hungry. Education is able to bring equality. Education is able to bring the possibility. Tonight's special assignment is dedicated to our youth through three young achievers who are making a difference and consequently improving the lives of other people through their work. In a 2014 report from the World Economic Forum, South Africa was placed last out of 148 countries in terms of the quality of its math and science education. But Lebang Nong is one person who's determined to turn the situation around. Born in Shawelo, Soweto, Nong says he participated in his first social justice campaign at the age of nine, and he's been an advocate for change since. One Saturday morning in Protea Glen, Soweto, we attended one of his tutoring and mentoring sessions and soon discovered his love for education began at a tender age in primary school. Um, when my teacher, my math teacher, Mem Zunja, um, gave me the opportunity to teach in class. So that's when I was still a young boy. And that's when I started to love mathematics. And from that point till today, mathematics has been part of me. Years later in high school, tragedy struck. And it's during this time that the seeds of leadership that had been planted years before started to germinate. 2004, uh, I went to a school in Almond Technical High School and my math teacher was involved in a car accident. And I was doing high grade mathematics. Back in the day, you'd have the higher grade mathematics and you also would have the standard grade mathematics. So this is curriculum 2005. And at that time, we did not have a teacher. I think two months to three months, we did not have a teacher. And that's when I started the program. I actually started the program because a lot of people wanted to leave maths. Because remember back then, you'd have the pure maths, the, the commerce and the general. A lot of my friends wanted to leave mathematics, and that's when I started to teach. Lebang's tutoring program to assist his fellow learners continued in his matric year. Soon, news of his lessons spread, and the sessions expanded to include learners from neighboring schools. Teachers were astounded at the number of learners that would attend the sessions from other schools. I was shocked to realize that there are so many kids and some we don't know, and they all told us that they were invited by Lebang. And you know, that was a humbling part because when, you were, when we went to go and find out, Lebang, how did you start this? I said, but ma'am, it's not me, they came. But you could see that, you know what? It's him, it's the teacher in him that was talking. She admits Lebang's teaching methods made such a great impact on the learners that it would often put the other teachers under pressure to perform. It was like, no, Lebang would not say that. Lebang did not say that to us. So Lebang was a better teacher than the real teachers. <laughs> Actually, when you went to, into that class, you had to be on top of your game because they had questions. They, they would challenge you. In 2006, Lebang officially established the NPO, Gadlejo Pele Education, which translated means success first. But a year later, this almost came to an end. His decision to continue tutoring during the teacher strikes of 2007 put his life in danger. I remember quite well when that incident took place. I continued and they came. So the people were striking to say, what are you doing here? I think you should be 
uh, stopping whatever that you're doing. But fortunately enough, because I look young, I was able to tell them, no, I'm actually a student. And then they allowed us, then we stopped. Then we started going to churches, churches like the Roman Catholic around my neighborhood, uh, community centers like Triple C that helped us with their venue. So we had the learners Monday, Tuesday at a certain venue, then take them to another place. To a point where the community hall was so full that we even used, uh, what do you call this, the, um, the sports field to teach the kids. And the kids didn't mind. And you can imagine at that point in time, it was very cold, but the kids loved the maths and the physics that we were teaching at that point. And a lot of students were produced from that year. I mean, you've got engineers, you've got electrical engineers as well, accountants, economists, that were from that group. Now, in its ninth year, Nong says his tutoring and mentorship organization has achieved outstanding results. He and his co-workers tutor learners in English, maths, science, accounting, and physics. He also teaches learners interview skills and helps them with university applications. He admits most learners are generally underperforming when they enter the Katleho Pele education program. But through the Saturday tutoring sessions, together with the mentorship they receive, these learners see a remarkable improvement in their exam results. We've produced the top student of Soweto in 2010 with 100% mathematics, 95% physics. This is a learner we took since grade 10. This is a learner, 2011, top four student of Soweto. We've produced many students. The story continues because we're still producing more. Kajajo Pele Education's 100% pass rate in 2013 for their participating matric learners is the reason Nong passionately continues this work. The majority of the learners receive bachelor passes, which allows them entrance into university. Nong proudly says many of their learners go on to study at tertiary institutions and graduate with degrees in applied mathematics, mechanical engineering and accounting. So we tracked down one of his success stories, Saulin Banda at Wits University, who is now on her way to becoming a chartered accountant. She joined the program in a matric year, where she says she was scraping by with marks above 50. At the end of the year, however, she got five distinctions. We asked her what made the tutoring sessions different and better compared to the teaching at school. It's that type of a place where you realize that, hey, things don't come easy, and if you want good grades, you gotta work for them, so you gotta do the work. And because no one is settling for your mediocre stories and your mediocre achievements, it kind of pushes you to work, because you can, like, say, I oh, mean, this is difficult and all of that, you know, so, and, I mean, just because it's difficult, it's okay not to do well, type of a thing, you know. And also, um, the people you're around, being surrounded with people with the same goal. You know, um, I, think, I think the biggest difference to that place and an ordinary school is everyone's just like, okay, we're gonna finish matric, but then it, no one is actually saying something about what's actually gonna get done when you finish matric. These sentiments are echoed by current learners in the program who say they're experiencing improvements in their grades. Most of my subjects went up, but especially my maths. So it's a very, it's, it's very informative, like it's, it's just too good to not come here. If you don't come here, then you don't have the best, in, the best tutors ever. Education is able to bring equality. Education is able to bring the possibility. And that's why Katlebele Education, our logo is Achieve a Dream. So regardless of where you come from, education can really translate you to the next position. So basically but it's not just the learners who have benefited, it's also the tutors. Sibusi Sokonyana is a final year geology student at the University of Johannesburg. He joined in 2011 when he was taking a gap year. He's since stuck around. I was a bit of a shy person. Now I no longer have, for example, when I started, you know, when I, when I were to stand in front of the board for the first couple of minutes, ish, you know, I was a bit nervous. But since then, that has gone away. So now I can publicly, you know, stand in front of people and say whatever I have to say without even have to, having to think twice about that. So I'd say it's kind of built me. It's shed off that shyness from me. So just why is it important to help learners do well at school? It's important because we also come from this community and we'd like to see better leaders in the future. So if we, those type of leaders or those type of people that are just relaxed at home and complaining and not make, actually making a difference, I don't think we can become a successful South Africa. Sitembile Ndombela is the acting chief marketing officer for Brand South Africa, an agency tasked with marketing our country. She is proud of young people like Lebang who are giving the country a positive image through their work. If youth of today can be the youth that says, I am able to see the gaps in our country, 
in terms of how we can progress it forward. And I am able to provide solutions. I say ahoy to those who have played that part. And I really say continue to play your parts because it is through the bits and pieces that we all do together that actually inspires the world. Nuang says he's been able to do this because of inspiration from the youth of 1976. It can never be words to express how much, you know, we are grateful of this as, as this young youth, about the youth of then. Because all they wanted to do was to bring change, is to bring equilibrium, to bring a status where everyone could be celebrated through their achievement. And that's, that's one of the reasons that why we continuously do this. It's been said that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, but thousands of school children still go without it, making learning and concentrating in class a hurdle. But that's where Dr. Zodwan Bambo at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research comes in. I want to make sure that no child goes to school hungry. By combining the power of food and pharmaceuticals, we want to make malnutrition a thing of the past. A study revealed that malnutrition is common in the rural areas, particularly among young children who often are undernourished and deficient in micronutrients, especially vitamin A, zinc and iron. Dr. Zodwa's research scientifically identifies key nutrients in leafy green vegetables that could go a long way in alleviating malnutrition. So what we did was we created a fortified um, drink that we are serving to school-going kids in the Eastern Cape. This is coming from a study that was done in South Africa that shows that children in the rural areas sometimes don't even have breakfast before they go to school. Now you can imagine if you didn't have breakfast, you won't be able to concentrate, you won't be able to learn in class and you fall asleep and so on and so forth. So from that we decided that you know, we need um, um, an intervention. So we have this intervention in the Eastern Cape where we feed them um, this glass of the neutral drink in the morning. She says the contents of the drink were chosen carefully. We included um, beetroot, we included um, sorghum as well, which is known to have high vitamin A content. And um, we, we included a green leafy vegetable as well in, 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 in that. So it's a, it's a mixture of, 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 of vegetables which is really highly nutritious and gives the kids the energy they need in the morning. The CSIR, together with the Department of Science and Technology, launched the nutritional drink pilot at five Tsofimvamba schools in the Chris Honey District Municipality in the Eastern Cape two years ago. The district reportedly has a high malnutrition and hunger index. It's a very poor area uh, uh, with uh, a population which is not yet educated. Most of the people who are living here are not educated and they are, they are not more skilled. Although there's a little bit of agriculture that is taking place around this place, but people are very poor in this area. Some of the learners, when they come to school, you, you see that now they, they, they don't get enough uh, benefits in terms. Some of them, they come to school hungry and some of them, they don't have enough uh, uniform in terms of food for winter and so on. Didi Moroka, CSIR's acting competency area manager, says the project in its entirety focuses on four areas of intervention, providing breakfast, improving kitchen facilities and training of food handlers, growing school gardens and creating nutritional awareness. Training of the, of the, of, of, of the ladies is very critical. Because we look at uh, food safety issues, we look at hygiene issues, um, and also we look at the, the cooking itself. You know, because remember we, we're taking women from from the community to come and cook for the kids, but then we also want the kids to eat good food. We also want them to enjoy the food that they're eating. So far, the results have been remarkable. Kids are now coming to school early. You know, they are early because they know if they are not early, they won't get the juice and then get to class because this is something that is served as breakfast. So you run quickly, pick up the juice, drink, and then run to class. Also, we managed to curb absenteeism. Sitembile Ntombela says Dr. Zotwa's work touches on a pillar fundamental to the functioning of our country, and her work is exemplary. And when you go and intervene, 
that's who we are and that's what we Zoda, Dr. Zoda does a, a remarkable job because if you look long term and you say how does health how does education impact South Africa? It actually impacts South Africa on an image point of view because it's how it's what we do that affects how the world sees South Africa. And if we do well in those pillars of health, if we do well in the pillars of education, we will definitely inspire the world to say, wow, we love South African South Africans. Zodwa is a, a very a very special person. Uh, she, she, she's very energetic and you can see it even in her spark. Uh, you know, when, when you talk to her and you talk to her about work, you can see her eyes, you know. So um, she, she is one of our, our shining stars, our young shining stars. We discovered that her lifestyle also complements her work on healthy living. We caught up with her and her friend cycling on a Saturday morning. This is basically a way of life for the both of us and her. So this is just one of the other things that she does. Not only does she cycle, we swim together and we run together. She says her friend embodies the courageous yeah. spirits of the class of 1976. Not only is she one of the few female doctors in her field, she is leading by a serious example. The youth of the 1976, they stood for something and she's bridging that gap, she's standing for something. We can do a lot of research in the lab and so on, but if it doesn't really impact on anybody's life, you know, if it doesn't change anybody's life and improve anybody's situation, then what is really the point, you know what I mean? Most scientists get to live their lives um, without seeing their work making an impact. So this was the most beautiful thing for me, that you could really immediately see and, and work on something that you can see having an impact um, when you are alive and you can see changing people's lives. So that is something I'm really passionate about. We asked her what her advice for other young people wanting to go into this field is. You're going to spend a lot of time working and you're going to spend a lot of time in the lab. And what's going to keep you there is your passion, you know, for what you do and your love for what you do. We basically don't keep eight to five jobs, you know, you can be here till nine, ten, whatever, you know, your experiment is going to end. So it has to be something that they're really passionate about. And this is not just for science as well, I guess for any field, you know, they say that if you do something that you love, you never have to work a day in your life. The class of 1976 demonstrated exceptional organizational skills because they were able to mobilize each other and plan accordingly. This is according to Department of Basic Education spokesperson Elijah Mshanga. He says the youth of today should emulate the spirit to solve some of the challenges our country faces. We have challenges now as a country and you find that we have old people that are trying to address the challenges we face now for the future. For example, now we have uh, this whole issue of, of load shedding and all of those things. Young people must say, we don't want load shedding uh, in the next 10 years. We, we don't want load shedding in our time. We want to come up with all sorts of solutions that will ensure that we are able to supply power to every household, to every school, to every office, to every building without uh, running out of, of, of supply. One of the fields that is often overlooked, yet is integral to our society, is the role of the arts and artists as social commentators. Artists hold a mirror up to society. They make us aware of who we are and the choices we're making. Blessing Gobeni is a visual artist whose work is born of his past experiences and present observations. He's lived on the streets and knows the underbelly of society too well. The energy of the city is like the blood that fuels his work. He makes us look at things that make us uncomfortable. Two years ago, Samuel L. Jackson walked into Blessing Gobeni's studio and asked him to finish the painting he was working on so he could buy it. The then 28-year-old with no formal training was overwhelmed. One day when he arrived in my studio, I was surprised to say, wow, you know, this is me with his person that I never think of in, in my life, I'll meet in my life. That's where I got to understand, okay, art is big, you know, so I have to take it serious, not uh, like as play, playing thing. 
A broken home and an abusive uncle forced him to flee his home in Zanin, Limpopo, to Johannesburg, where he survived on the streets when he was barely 10. He lived under a bridge in Alex and fell in with a bad crowd who did crime to survive. Blessing remembers a moment when he tried to mug a lady who fought back. She managed to grab me and then she... I, I fell down and then she jumped on top of me, she sat on top of me, she strangled me and then I got suffocated and then when I stand up I collapsed, you know, and come back again to life and then from there she just said I would kill you and then she ran away, she, she went, you know, like, you know what, next time you do, you repeat the same thing, I'll kill you, you know, so th th those are the moments that I realized that, you know what, this is danger, I'm, I'm playing with danger. But it didn't end there. In 1999, uh, I got uh, arrested then because of some chaos that we did. Because I got introduced to some like, big, uh, big people that has, you know, like guns. So I, that's where I learned how to use a gun. So I used the gun to try to rob a garage in Randbeck and then we couldn't um, survive from there. He spent close to six years in juvenile detention, where he took stock of his life and participated in an art program which determined the direction his life would take. Art gave him a focus and much needed catharsis. It was that moment where you get lonely and you start to uh, work hard deep, deep within yourself to keep yourself busy, you know, than st staying and watching other inmates uh, stabbing each other or, you know. So, I mean, I didn't... I, I, I didn't have any interest in soccer, any interest in any activities that was happening there. I was, my interest was much more into, into art because I would spend my whole day in my cell just drawing, sketching. Years later, with several recognitions underneath his belt, including winning the Reynard Cassia Award in 2012, he's about to have his third solo exhibition. This is a big deal, explains his gallery. If you think about the amount of singers, songwriters that actually make it. It's the same in the visual art world. It's, you can't one day wake up and think, oh great, because I can, you know, that guy drew a stick drawing and he made it, it must be easy. It's not easy, you have to be, that, that guy who drew, drew the stick drawing and made it has a very specific context and a very specific talent. There's, it's not simple. Weber says Blessing's work is spectacular and is an important tool in society. If you look back, the things that remain are not the, the gossip of the day or anything like that. The things that really remain are the pieces of artwork, be it literature, music, visual arts, photography, whatever it is. That's really, it is such a powerful sociological tool and it transcends language, culture, because humans are visual people. His work falls under surrealism art and provides an escape for him as he doesn't like to dwell too much on his past. The work reflects city life and his experiences. Art is important because it, it, it heals you know, a person. It, um, it become a food, it become um, you know, when, when, when you're feeling pain, it heals you, you know. The moment when you look at a masterpiece, an artwork that is strong enough, you know, as a viewer, somewhere, somehow you get touched. He says he has an important role in society, and art is his way of voicing an opinion. Somewhere, somehow, uh, we have things that we cannot tell, like in, with our mouths or with our words, but... We have things that we can tell through a visual, in a visual form, which those are the things that are almost in us. So in order for them to come out, we need a form of expression, like, like um, you know, in a different manner, though, not like ordinary way of, you know, painting. So, yeah, I, 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 that's why I, I, I got all these inspirations that made me to, to paint more.